It's uh, uh, truly a great pleasure to uh, uh, welcome uh, Felix Soto for this uh, special distinguished lecture today. So I'm uh, one of the organizers of this uh, of this program uh, that's wrapping up the semester, and it's uh, especially I'm especially happy to be able to make this introduction because when in many ways uh, uh, Felix is, is uh, gave birth to the entire idea behind this program. Uh, so I think auto calculus is really uh, what is driving a lot of us uh, for the and the methods that we're actually employing and some of the ideas of, of you know moving particles thanks to uh, Wasserstein calculus. So I mean I, I I think it's great to have your name uh, attached to calculus. I think neither <laughs> Newton nor Leibniz uh, do have this. And uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's really an honor. Uh, so we all know this as uh, as JKO. But uh, of course, uh, uh, even the, the auto calculus is really what is driving us. I mean, auto uh, JKO is something that makes it more formal mathematically. But uh, uh, I, I do like to think in, in this terms, and it really enlightened me when I actually came up with it. And uh, finally, I, I you know, so this is actually my last uh, day today. So I'm very happy that I can actually attend this lecture. And you all know that I'm making T-shirts. And now I feel really bad because you really are the name that's missing, right? I mean, I couldn't come up with anything smart enough to actually put your name on a t-shirt, but you would definitely be a great candidate for this, <laughs> even closer to those. So I have to have my Caffarelli t-shirt. And um, and uh, I'm hoping I, I will actually work hard to try to come up with a, with an uh, auto one and I'll send uh, I'll send uh, it to, uh, to uh, the uh, participants of the program. So without uh, further more further ado, I will let uh, Felix talk about mean curvature flow and, and, and gradient flows. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks for the invitation for the month here. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, so what, I, um, what we speak about is not related to uh, the uh, Wasserstein or optimal transportation, but it's related to, uh, to time discretizations of gradient flows. And uh, uh, in particular, uh, kind of ideas which uh, uh, which go back to the Georgie, although, as I will mention, in the end, it might be that uh, kind of the first people really kind of popularized the minimizing movement scheme might be, again, the geometers, uh, uh, the Unger and Taylor Wong scheme, which I will mention in, in, in passing. Okay, so, uh, so the talk is, um, is a bit of a hybrid uh, subject. Uh, I will start out with uh, with a bit of uh, geometric analysis, reminding you what the uh, uh, flow of a surface by its mean curvature is. Um, I, I, I will tell you that uh, in this, because that for, for us was the motivation, um, I will tell you that um, an us means Selim uh, Ezeduglu, uh, with whom I'm kind of started this, uh, uh, this work, uh, actually when both of us were at the IMA at, uh, in Minneapolis, uh, so a connection to material science, uh, uh, the growth of grains and polycrystals, something I will explain. And then, but then the focus will be uh, on making a connection to analysis on metric spaces. Uh, so, uh, so some of the ideas of DeGiorgi to deal with uh, gradient flows. And, but then it will all be applied to a to very popular and successful numerical scheme uh, by, um, Benz, Merriman, and Osher, uh, the so-called thresholding scheme, which is an numerical scheme for mean curvature flow. So that's the uh, that's the plan. So uh, so this is just uh, just a reminder of what uh, uh, what uh, what mean curvature flow is. So the motion of uh, um, uh, of a surface by uh, by its mean curvature. So the mean curvature of a surface is uh, is one of kind of the two. Uh, most common curvatures of the surface here it's kind of the the sum of the two principal curvatures and i will tell you why this is a natural quantity in a second and uh, uh, so uh, so flow by mean curvature means that uh, uh, whenever uh, uh, your surface uh, which bounds kind of a domain let's say uh, is is more convex uh, looking it shrinks and when it's more concave looking it it, it grows and that is, in a certain sense, the right sign. So mathematically, that's expressed by saying that the normal velocity is equal to, uh, uh, to the mean curvature, again, up to the sign. And, and, the, and the sign is chosen in such a way that this is kind of a regularizing uh, motion in the sense that if you start out with a corrugated surface, this will, uh, this will smooth out. 
but, uh, but in fact, that's in a certain sense just the small data behavior uh, because of uh, the high nonlinearity of the problem. In fact, uh, uh, if you're not dealing with curves, but with surfaces, uh, singularities may actually occur. Uh, so, uh, so you may have this type of uh, neck pinching in a dumbbell as indicated here. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an easy to write down uh, geometric evolution problem, which does, produce, uh, which does produce singularities. And in a certain sense, you may see it as, a, as kind of a geometric version of heat flow or a diffusion equation. And it's the uh, uh, extrinsic version of uh, a geometric heat flow as opposed to Ricci flow, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is an intrinsic version of, uh, of geometric heat flow. Okay, so that's a brief reminder of uh, mean curvature flow. And, uh, and the reason why it's popular in, in, in modeling and material science is that it's, uh, well, I mean, it dissipates interfacial energy. And in fact, uh, apparently it was formulated in material science by Mullins before uh, it was formulated in geometry. And that's, uh, that's related to, uh, to the simple fact that uh, mean curvature, so this specific combination of principal curvatures has the interpretation of being the first variation of the, of the uh, functional of the surface area. So if a, const, if, if a surface has, uh, has, uh, has const, I mean, has vanishing mean curvature and you uh, uh, look at its parallel surfaces, then at least first order, they have the same area. So uh, what that means for mean curvature flow is that if you monitor the total surface area in time, then you always get a, a non-positive quantity, which you can either write as uh, 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 the integral of the square of the curvature or the integral of the square of the normal velocity, whatever you please. So anyway, it's clear that it's a dynamic which dissipates interfacial energy. So that's, uh, uh, that's what, uh, what makes it valuable. And uh, so one, um, <clears throat> one instance where it has been written down by uh, uh, by uh, in, in material science is uh, when modeling uh, the uh, uh, the uh, when modeling modeling polycrystalline materials. So uh, uh, so those are let's say metals which don't come in form of a clean single crystal, but which are made out of different grains, which are distinguished by their different lattice orientation, and clearly since uh, along a grain boundary. Uh, your atoms are not in, a, in their favorite uh, position, there is something like, at least on a mesoscopic level, an interfacial energy attached to this, uh, to this, uh, to this interface. And what you observe is that uh, over uh, certain time scales, and that depends on the temperature, uh, such a system tries to reduce the, uh, uh, reduce the interfacial area. And, uh, and so for this mean curvature flow has been written down, but of course, in this type of application, you never have a single or two grains, but you have many grains. And as soon as you have more than two grains, you have something which, uh, which is called triple junctions. So in the real world, that this would be, of course, some kind of uh, a line, uh, kind of a co-dimension two object. And, uh, and then at these triple junctions, let's put, think for a moment of a two-dimensional world, you have an additional condition which is kind of a force balance between the surface tensions. So, uh, so all the three surface tensions in a certain sense pull. If they're all equal, they pull in an equal way. And you have an equilibrium condition here at the, at the triple junction, which goes by the name of, or which Herring wrote down first. Uh, it's an angle condition. And uh, in, in such a situation, so when you have just more than one phase, you have more types of singularities than the one neck pinching singularity, which I mentioned before, because uh, kind of uh, generically, you would have this type of exchange of neighboring of uh, uh, grains, and you would have grains that vanish like in this situation. And in fact, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's in the end, the important mechanism for physics for what's called grain growth, namely that you start out uh, initially with, uh, uh, with a configuration which has a very, very fine arrangement of grains. And then through uh, this type of mean multi-phase mean curvature flow, going through uh, several, um, uh, um, uh, singularities of this type, uh, the, uh, uh, this configuration coarsens and the number of grains reduces 
And this is something which, uh, in a certain sense, this statistically self-similar behavior of which you would like to understand. And uh, that's another topic which uh, I know from, uh, from David Kinderlea, who was very interested in that uh, in the last 10, 20 years. So, uh, uh, so that's where uh, kind of multi-phase uh, mean curvature flow comes up. And uh, uh, now let's change kind of uh, perspective a bit. And uh, let me point out, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, that at least formally <clears throat> mean curvature flow, no matter whether it's the two-phase or the multi-phase case, can be considered as, uh, as gradient flow. So uh, in, in a suitable sense, uh, this uh, uh, kind of innocuous looking equation uh, can be interpreted as, as, as a gradient flow of the surface area with respect to a formal Riemannian structure on the, on the surfaces. I'll tell you in a second what that Riemannian structure is. And, uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so that's uh, having, having this type of uh, gradient flow structure for an evolution equation is, is something that's uh, valuable because uh, it allows you to uh, think in terms of geometry, uh, of infinite dimensional geometry on configuration space. And as I like to stress, uh, uh, for a gradient flow, it's not just the height function, which is the energy functional that matters, uh, but uh, the um, geometry on configuration space. So the notion of distance on the configuration space is equally important because only the combination of the two tells you in which direction your energy landscape is steep and in which direction it's shallow. So only that combination of these two tells you in which direction the system will develop, um, will evolve. So, uh, so, so this uh, kind of thinking in terms of the geometry uh, in, in the large is, <clears throat> is helpful, but then you realize, uh, and uh, that has been done a while ago, that the formal Riemannian geometry, which you need in order to make mean curvature flow into gradient flow, and that's the Riemannian geometry where the inner product uh, is the L2 norm or the square L2 norm of the normal velocity over the surface. So that's a truly Riemannian structure because the inner product depends on the configuration where you are. That if you write down uh, this type of uh, uh, least, uh, least energy uh, problem, so you look at the uh, energy of a curve, which means integrating the normal velocity, which describes this curve of configurations, first over the evolving configurations, then over your time parameter, that this infimum is always equal to zero. So, uh, so that's a as opposed to uh, the Wasserstein uh, uh, geometry. This is at first uh, you lose all hope because uh, uh, because you can't really give a sense to that uh, to that distance function at the large. And um, so, but let's not worry about this for for a moment, and uh, let's do as if uh, uh, we uh, we had a nice distance function for this problem or a proxy to. The distance function. Then uh, something uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which in a certain sense I grew up with uh, is to write down uh, the time discretization of such a gradient flow and the kind of conceptual advantage of writing, writing down a time discretization is in a certain sense it looks much more robust. You don't need derivatives. You just need your distance function and your energy function. You don't need any gradient of your energy or uh, that kind of stuff. So it's something which you can formulate in the context of a metric space. And uh, so, uh, uh, so you, minimize, uh, you minimize the squared distance to your previous configuration with one over two times this time step size plus the energy function. So that's, uh, that's minimizing movements. And, uh, and in, the, uh, in the Euclidean case, when your metric space is Euclidean space, then it's easy to see uh, if you write down the first variation of this variational problem, that what you're doing is really just the implicit or backwards order scheme discretization of that gradient flow. That's what it, uh, that's what it boils down to. So, um, so far so good. And uh, then you get very excited because uh, this, variational <clears throat> this variational problem in a certain sense gives you an estimate for free. 
because uh, you can always compare uh, your minimal energy uh, uh, to uh, uh, to comparing it to the previous uh, to the previous uh, configuration. And if you do that, uh, uh, and you write down these kind of for every time step, you write down uh, the inequality which you get from the simple comparison, and you sum them up. You get this type of uh, by telescoping. You get this type of uh, uh, this type of uh, clean inequality which tells you uh, uh, not only that the energy kind of always decreases, always below the initial energy, but it also gives you, uh, gives you control over this uh, kind of uh, length term, this dissipative term. And now, now you look, uh, now, now at first uh, you're extremely excited or you know, when, when at least an analyst would be very excited because uh, in your mind, you would try already to pass to the limit, letting the time step size go to zero. And if you do that, you get, uh, you get something which looks like the energy identity for gradient flow. And, uh, but there is one problem. There's a factor of one half here, which is too much. So, uh, so the simple-minded a priori estimate, which you get from the variational structure of this time step minimization, in a certain sense, misses a factor of one half and therefore, it's certainly not in any way sufficient to characterize the dynamics. That's kind of uh, a fact of life. And that was exactly what uh, kind of De Georgi realized. Uh, probably he was not first to realize it, but uh, he was uh, somebody who wrote down, kind of who gave ideas how to overcome this. And uh, so the two, uh, the two tools he uh, he came up with uh, are the uh, what's called the variational interpolation on the one hand, and the metric slope uh, on the other hand. So that's explained on this slide. So uh, uh, so the more subtle quest, the more subtle tool is this variational interpolation, and it it's related to the fact that if you want to kind of do uh, let the time step size go to zero, connect to a kind of a limiting uh, evolution. Uh, well, I mean, the naive thing you would do is you would somehow interpolate your discrete solution in time uh, over your time steps of size h. And the simplest way, of course, is to take just the piecewise constant in time interpolation. But you can do a smarter way. I mean, now as a numerical analyst, at first you would say, well, let's do it piecewise linear. But that doesn't make any sense because m doesn't have even a linear structure. So, uh, so doing a piecewise linear interpolation doesn't have any meaning at this stage. And so what the Georgie proposed is to uh, just use the tools which you have at your disposal, namely the metric and the energy functional, to construct an interpolation that in a certain sense mimics a continuous interpolation. And he does that by just playing with the, uh, uh, with the time step size parameter if f uh, goes to zero, then this term is penalized a lot. So the minimizer will be very close to chi n minus one to the previous time step. And if s is equal to h, uh, well, you get the variational problem which defines the next time step. So in principle, uh, 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 this should provide, uh, that's not necessarily continuous, but uh, a reasonable intrinsic interpolation of these two configurations. So that's the first idea. And the second idea is to uh, say, well, I mean, although we don't really have access to a gradient uh, in, a, in a purely metric geometry, we have access to something which you may think of as, a, as, a, as, 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 as the length of a gradient, as the slope, by, using a, by looking at the usual difference quotient. And now, uh, now he introduced these two notions, the variational interpolation, yes? Uh, if, if the distance is uh, the Euclidean distance, this corresponds to, uh, to what? Piecewise linear? Or? Um, that's a good question. I would assume yes. Okay. I would assume that uh, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, well, no, it also depends on this functional here, right? So something it's else. it's something else, right? Uh, if uh, if this here would be just the norm squared, then probably it would be the piecewise linear. But even in the even in the even in the Euclidean case, this would be something nonlinear. Good question. 
Okay, so um, so he introduced these tools because then he could do uh, he could write down something. So with these tools, you can write down an inequality, which uh, uh, looks a little bit like what you would na naively do. So there is the energy at time step n, there is the initial energy, there's one half times this metric term. But what he gains is uh, this second term here, which involves the metric slope and which involves the variational interpolation. And that's a completely general, uh, general inequality. And so why did he like it? And why, why, why do we like it? Because in a certain sense, again, it suggests that you may pass to the limit in this inequality. So passing to the limit in this metric term should give you kind of the, uh, the energy of the curve up to a factor one half. And passing, uh, passing to the limit in this, uh, in this slope term, in this gradient term, at least if you were in the Riemannian context, should give you uh, the squared norm, squared Euclidean norm of the gradient. So, uh, uh, so you, 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 you believe that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between this discrete inequality, which is exact, and this limiting <clears throat> continuum inequality. And then you realize that this limiting of Euclidean, this limiting continuum inequality, despite the fact that it's just an inequality, in fact, is equivalent to the gradient flow formulation that you just see by writing this difference of energies as the time integral over the time derivative of the energy and using chain rule. And then you see that what you get is exactly what you need to complete the square. And then uh, the inequality is enough to give you this result. So that's, uh, that's another key idea of the Georgie that uh, it's enough to have an inequality to, uh, uh, to characterize a gradient flow. And that of course now kind of cries out for soft methods. So you would expect that you can use this strategy to prove not just convergence of gradient flows, but uh, you know, even in more complicated situations where homogenization is involved, to pass to the limit in this type of inequality information, because all you need is lower semi-continuity. So it looks as, as kind of an like extremely, extremely promising and powerful tool. But uh, uh, but that's uh, so far. I don't think it has been used uh, uh, used a lot. And uh, and what I want to present is kind of one one uh, application of this. Okay, so last, uh, last of the four topics is this uh, numerical scheme for, <clears throat> for mean curvature flow, uh, which uh, is, is extremely intuitive and extremely easy to write down. And so it was introduced uh, almost 30 years ago. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the following idea. So you describe, <clears throat> you describe a set uh, and you're interested in the boundary and the evolution of the boundary of the set by its characteristic function. So it's equal to one inside and equal to zero outside. So it's uh, in every time step, you do two, two operations, two simple operations. Um, you solve the heat equation uh, for this time step H, which means uh, essentially you're convolving with the heat kernel or you're convolving with the Gaussian of variance H. So then you get, uh, you get uh, kind of this red function, which has values typically strictly between zero and one. That's the convolution step. And then in the uh, uh, thresholding step, uh, you ask where this new function is larger or smaller than one half. And that gives you a new characteristic function. And that gives you kind of a new set after you know, the one step uh, further in the, uh, in the time. So let me... Uh, show you one, uh, one numerical simulation here. Uh, so uh, we start out with this uh, kind of peanut shape. Uh, we do the convolution step, then of course you get blurry. And then we look for the level set one half and that defines the new set. And you already see that in a certain sense, it has done a little bit the right thing because uh, these two points have moved in because if you take the convolution, around a point here on the boundary, you see more white than black because the convolution kernel is really symmetric. 
So at this point, uh, after convolution, your function will be less than one half. So this point will then lie here in the white region. Whereas if you do it in this point here, provided H is sufficiently small, you see more black than white. So that one will have moved out. So it's a, it's, it, it clearly qualitatively does the right thing. And, uh, and also numerically, it's extremely performant because now you can discretize it in space. You could do that in either simple way. And then you use fast Fourier transform to carry out the convolution, or you do it in a smarter way where you just monitor kind of small neighborhoods of, uh, of the interface and you use uh, things which have been developed here by Jamie Sethian, like the fast marching algorithm. So that's a very, uh, a very performant numerical scheme for mean curvature flow. And, uh, um, and like all good schemes, it kind of preserves a property of the, uh, um, uh, of the continuum uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the limiting problem, and that's comparison. So uh, this scheme clearly has the property if initially or at the previous time step, your two sets are nested, which means you have an inequality between the two characteristic functions. That's preserved by convolution with a non-negative kernel like Gaussian, and that's preserved by thresholding. And, uh, uh, and that's exactly also the property which we know from, uh, from mean curvature flow, from one or two phase mean curvature flow, that this nestedness is being preserved. And that, uh, uh, thanks to this very perform, very practical and powerful method of viscosity solutions, already allows you to give kind of a convergence proof of the scheme, which, uh, you know, Craig Evans started that and a number of people were involved uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to this uh, kind of soft notion of, uh, of mean curvature flow. So it's a good scheme because it preserves one of, uh, one of the kind of crucial properties of the, uh, of the continuum uh, evolution, which is comparison principle. Now, it, it's also a good scheme because uh, it can be without any problems, it can be extended to the multi-phase case. I mean, uh, here, it's very easy. Now you have kind of, in just of having, instead of just having a single characteristic function, you have n characteristic functions, which kind of fill up space. Uh, so in the, in, in the two phase case, what I see, you will have two, uh, two characteristic functions, chi and one minus chi. And now you have uh, n, n larger than two. And you do exactly the same thing. You, uh, you convolve each of them with, uh, with your Gaussian. And then you ask the question, which of the, which of the ones is largest? And here it's kind of, there's an indication in terms of color uh, so we start out with this configuration, and here the angle condition is clearly not satisfied. We blur the picture, then we threshold, and already after one time step, you get the, uh, tr the right condition at the triple point, uh, and so on. And, uh, and this has been uh, proven to, uh, uh, to work uh, in engineering applications with uh, hundred thousands of grains in three dimensions. So it's a very performing, uh, performant uh, numerical scheme. And, uh, but, the, uh, but the theory in the multi-phase case is more subtle because you don't have a comparison principle. So you have to resort to other notions of solution for mean curvature flow. And it was only fairly recently that uh, uh, Kim and Tonegawa showed that uh, 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 there is convergence to, uh, to this notion by Bracke, which I, perhaps I have the time to mention it later. And, but there's also quite some activity on the, in the two-dimensional case, the coarsening of networks and uh, trying to construct uh, more classical solutions in this case. So that's the, uh, uh, that's the multi-phase case. And, and so the, 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 the two questions we contributed a bit to are the following. Um, so in, in grain growth, uh, you don't want the surface tension to be uh, always equal. In fact, you want to be able to choose surface tensions, which can be uh, different for every care, uh, pair of grains. So uh, depending on whether you, you connect one and three or two and one, you want to be able to impose a different type of surface tension. So how can you modify 
this uh, very simple multi-phase thresholding scheme, which I wrote down before, in order to accommodate for more general surface tensions. That was not clear. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and kind of, I will show you a very, a very simple idea of how to do that. And the second question is, uh, can one give a convergence result also in the multi-phase case? So the first uh, is, is work with uh, Silemi Zedoglu and the last is uh, work with uh, former PhD student, Tim Laux, who was postdoc here in, uh, in Berkeley and now is back in Bonn or is in Bonn. And, uh, and both ideas rely on the fact that uh, surprisingly, uh, but in a very simple way, uh, this thresholding scheme can be interpreted as a minimizing movement scheme. At first, it doesn't look variational at all, right? It's just, uh, in a certain sense, convolving and then thresholding. I mean, it's clear that in a certain sense, it has the max or the comparison principle built in, but uh, you don't see that it has the, uh, uh, that it has any type of gradient flow built in. But in fact, uh, it does. And, uh, and in a certain sense, the observation is almost, you know, I mean, it's just one, one line. It's a very simple observation. It's, uh, it's just on the slide. So here again, <clears throat> I wrote down in one line what this two tier, what this two stage thresholding scheme means. You take the previous time step size. I just do it in the two phase case now. You take the previous time step size, you convolve it with the Gaussian, you ask where it's larger than one half, that gives you the new characteristic function. So in fact, this characteristic function minimizes a functional which has the structure of uh, a term which uh, is a, dis a square distance to the previous time step, because this first term here is, uh, uh, is kind of the, uh, uh, in a certain sense, mollified L2 type of uh, inner, inner product squared. And uh, since the Fourier transform of uh, the Gaussian, which is again a Gaussian, is non-negative, this here is indeed uh, a strictly positive. This is indeed a norm squared. And a second part, uh, uh, which uh, I will show you in a second, can be interpreted as an energy. And so this very simple observation is that uh, this function here minimizes this, uh, this functional here among all functions which have values even between one. I mean, they don't have to be characteristic functions between zero and one. And it's just linear algebra. You just rewrite this term uh, in, this, in this way here. And uh, uh, in which case by the symmetry of this uh, convolution kernel, you get V times this red expression plus something which doesn't depend on, uh, uh, on V anymore. And then clearly in order to minimize this, you want V to be equal to one where this is positive and you want it equal to zero where this is negative. And that's exactly this choice here. So it's, uh, it's really just an embarrassingly simple observation that, uh, uh, that this scheme has this variational interpretation now, of course, that could be completely unrelated to mean curvature flow, but in fact, it's not. And that's, uh, that's the, uh, the, main, uh, the main insight. So, so here again is the, uh, is the variational structure. So here you have this square distance term. And here you have uh, uh, this term, which I want to see as an energy. And now if, perhaps I first should convince you that this is indeed something like a surface energy. So let's look at this term uh, a bit more carefully for a characteristic function chi. Uh, so what are you doing here? You're taking your characteristic function chi and you're convolving it. So it means you smear it out. And then you take the product with, with, uh, with the complement. Uh, you integrate this characteristic function of the complement. You take the product with one minus chi. So what you measure is this integral here and you measure that along the entire interface. And since the profile kind of modulates the interface, it's not surprising that this here to leading order is proportional to the length of the area of the interface, provided you rescale it in the right way with one over square root of h, because that's uh, the length of the kernel. This is how much spills out here. And that's exactly what here, what, what you have here. So in a, in, a, in a way which I will make precise, 
more precise in a second, this here indeed, as H goes to zero, looks like the interfacial energy, looks like the, the length of the interface. And in a very similar way, you can also convince yourself that the first, <clears throat> that the first term, this metric term, uh, in a certain sense, picks out the, uh, the amount by which you displace the new interface with respect to the old interface. So, uh, so both terms from this uh, heuristic point of view have clearly a connection uh, to mean curvature flow. So, and now the, uh, the observation is that also kind of in the multi-phase case, when all the surface tensions are, e are equal, uh, this uh, variational interpretation persists. In this case, the energy turns out to be, the, be this expression. So for any pairs of phases, I and J, which are different, you look at the similar type of expression, you kind of uh, take the integral, take the convolution of the J phase, you look how, how much of it gets into the I phase. And in fact, uh, there are interesting uh, gamma convergence results which show that this functional here gamma converges exactly, I mean, every part converges to the interface between I and J, which you can express in, uh, by using a bit of BV calculus in this way. And, uh, um, and then if you take this as the energy, that has to be the distance function, which is, uh, which is indeed a distance function. So also in this multi-phase case, thresholding can be interpreted in this variational case, in this variational way. So what's the advantage now? So one, one advantage is more applied math that uh, uh, this now gave us the idea of how to modify the thresholding scheme in order to allow for uh, different interfacial energies, depending on which pair of phases you have. But just taking the old expression and putting a sigma ij here, where sigma ij is the interfacial energy between uh, grain I or face I and face J. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, write down a variational, problem, a variational formulation exactly, uh, exactly in the same way. And then see what it means in terms of uh, uh, whether it can be interpreted in terms of thresholding. And yes, it can. And it has, you know, it has exactly the same complexity as the equal face case of thresholding. The only difference is that in the convolution step, you take this, uh, you take a combination which is weighted by the surface tensions. So that's the way how you should uh, kind of make the sigma ij's enter in your thresholding scheme in order to get, uh, uh, to get uh, multi-phase mean curvature flow. So without any dirty tricks and without any increase in complexity, you can, ac you can accommodate uh, uh, different uh, uh, n over two different surface tensions into the scheme. So that was uh, kind of the applied math uh, um, uh, consequence of this inside. And uh, okay, that's one, uh, that's one slide because uh, for this to work, we need two conditions on the sigma ij's. So uh, we need the triangle inequality, <clears throat> which is something very physical and uh, which you would uh, have no problems to uh, allow for, but we also need kind of a negative semi-definiteness on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the matrix where you put the sigma ij's off diagonal and uh, on, the hyper, on this hyperplane. And that's, uh, that's a condition which is not automatically fulfilled. And it has to do with embeddability of these, uh, uh, of these uh, sigma ij's, of these numbers sigma ij's as distances in a potentially high dimensional space. In four, uh, up to four different phases, it's almost, it's always satisfied. But if you have more than four phases, it's not clear. So at first it was not clear whether what we're doing is practical, but then we checked that it's, uh, uh, this condition is satisfied for the most common model in, uh, in grain growth, uh, which, uh, which goes by the name of Reed Shockley, where you say that the interfacial energy between a pair of grains is related to the misorientation. I mean, how much do you have to rotate? How much do you have to rotate the, uh, 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 the lattice in order to go from this grain to this grain? 
So, uh, uh, so what matters is kind of the relative orientation in terms of angles up to the symmetry, let's say the octahedral group. And then kind of, and there is some microscopic modeling which goes into this. Uh, the most common way you would have the surface energy depend on the angle is in this logarithmic way. And that, uh, uh, that does satisfy the condition. So, so therefore what we're doing is, is practical because also this negative semi-definite condition is, uh, is satisfied here. Okay, so how much time do I still have? Fifteen. Yes, then, uh, so let me tell you a bit about the, um, so that was the work with Selimi Zeduglu, then with uh, Tim Laux, we, uh, we said now that we have this, uh, uh, that we have this kind of uh, variational interpretation, this minimizing movements interpretation. Let's see whether we can uh, we can get a convergence proof from there. And uh, uh, we did that in the multi-phase case, but I'm going to tell it to you just in the two-phase case because then there is less to write. And the question now is 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 of course uh, uh, very natural. You suppose that you have initial data which have finite parameter in this BV notation, and uh, uh, and then you 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 run thresholding, and uh, the usual thresholding which does have this variational interpretation, but you don't care. You run your usual thresholding, and you ask the question: Does it converge? And we have three different convergence results which are all conditional in a way which I'm going to explain to you to uh, three different types of solutions. And perhaps the most interesting one is the last one, which is actually, which we proved last and where the proof is uh, softest. Uh, and that's connecting to, uh, uh, to the Georgie's uh, uh, notion, which I, which I mentioned at the beginning. And, uh, but uh, in all of these notions, we, we use kind of a little bit of, uh, geometric measure theory to be able to express what uh, mean curvature flow is. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, this concept anyway, I already used the notation of uh, expressing uh, interfacial area uh, defined by a characteristic function via the BV norm that relates to Cacciopoli sets that also gives rise to measure theoretic normal via polar factorization. In the same way you can introduce uh, a normal, uh, a normal velocity, just again, by putting all derivatives onto the test function. And in fact, you can also introduce mean curvature flow, I mean curvature in this way by integration by parts. So you have access to all these geometric notions in this, uh, in this robust and soft context, which uh, of course is well, very well known from, uh, from uh, um, um, uh, minimal surfaces. And so, uh, so the first result we got a while ago is that indeed uh, uh, um, the scheme converges to uh, such a weak notion of mean curvature flow, which can have singularities in the sense that there exists a normal velocity, which is an L2 in space time over the interface. So defined by this equation, such that the mean curvature is equal to this uh, velocity. Uh, and mean curvature is defined by this type of integration by parts. So that would be great, but uh, the convergence result we get is a conditional convergence result. We have to make an assumption. And, uh, and now in perhaps the last couple of minutes, I want to explain to you uh, why this assumption is, um, why first of all, we're in good company with this assumption. And you know, this assumption probably is, is not so easy to get rid of and how it connects to uh, uh, to a famous uh, minimizing movement scheme for mean curvature flow, which was first formulated by Unger and Taylor and Wong. So here again is our result. Uh, so uh, we get convergence of the thresholding scheme to uh, mean curvature flow in this uh, BV notion, provided uh, we have convergence of the energies. What we get for free for uh, by lower semi-continuity of the parameter is one inequality but here we're imposing convergence of the energies. So BV convergence, and that's more what we would get out of the typical energy estimate. So we were not too worried about this and got our paper accepted because, um, uh, because exactly the same assumption was made by uh, 
my advisor and somebody who did a PhD, uh, his PhD the same time as I did, um, on a scheme which is uh, which perhaps might be even more influential than the thresholding scheme, but which is completely academic, uh, which is the ATW scheme, the Armgren Taylor Wong scheme. And if you haven't heard of it, you should uh, you should know it because I think that was the minimizing movement scheme before the letter. Even the people in Pisa admit to the fact that this was there first. So, uh, so Armgren. Taylor and Wong wrote down a minimizing movement scheme for mean curvature flow, which takes this form here, which exactly has kind of minimizing movement form. Uh, you minimize the surface area of your current configuration. Uh, I mean, you, you minimize the surface area. You find the next, uh, the next configuration by minimizing the surface area plus one over two H times the square distance function. And uh, now the distance function they put is, is kind of judiciously designed, but it's very geometric. So what do they consider? They take the previous time step and then they look at the distance function, the unsigned distance function to the previous time step and integrate that over the kind of excess area uh, of the current time step with respect to the previous time step. So that doesn't have a much of a numerical appeal to it, but it was very influential in terms of uh, in terms of theoretical tool, in terms of thinking about mean curvature flow, and uh, and now this work by uh, by Lukas and Stutznecker was the first one that showed that indeed the scheme uh, does converge in this conditional sense. I mean, Amgen Taylor Wong had a also convergence result in their paper, but that was on a much stronger assumption. So, uh, uh, so, 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 so the, the, the interesting thing, I mean, is what, what I find nice is, is that in a certain sense, we now discovered that the most popular numerical scheme exactly has the same structure. And that in fact, this structure of the numerical scheme can be used to give the same type of conditional convergence result, which people gave for this academic scheme. Okay, so I'm going to finish soon. Um, now, in a certain sense, what we were not so happy with about this result here is that it did not at all connect to the gradient flow structure. In fact, these weak, this weak formulation by itself is not sufficient to show that the energy decreases in time. And uh, so therefore we said, let's connect to a notion of mean curvature flow which has this property built in. And there is such a notion of mean curvature flow, which is due to Bracke, uh, which is here, which not just expresses mean curvature flow as an inequality, but it also, I mean, it, it, it's really, um, if, 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 if the evolution were smooth, it's equivalent to mean curvature flow. And it has the advantage that it doesn't refer to the normal velocity. It just refers to the curvature itself and expresses the dynamics like this, and it contains the energy dissipation inequality. So, uh, so that's probably also very kind of important uh, insight that uh, you can encode a complicated PDE or geometric evolution in terms of an inequality, very much like the Georgie kind of said, we can uh, encode gradient flow by an inequality. And then what we did is uh, we used kind of the Georgie's ideas for gradient uh, for for metric gradient flows to derive this Bracke notion. So that was the uh, that was the second result. But then we said, okay, perhaps we can even make it simpler. And that was the last result, which just appeared in the proceeding, by really taking the Georgie uh, literally and passing to the limit in, in in this type of inequality, and that also works. And that proof is indeed surprisingly soft. So, uh, so in that proof, we still need our condition. I mean, our, our, it's still the same conditional result, but with this additional assumption uh, showing the lower semi-continuity of these terms in, in the mean curvature sense, which would be this here, is, uh, is surprisingly soft. So, uh, so in a certain sense, our results went from being pretty hard and using rectifiability and that kind of stuff 
to in the end being extremely soft and just using the ideas of the Georgie. So I have a couple of slides of these ideas, but probably I should stop and, uh, uh, and, uh, and come with a summary. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so in a certain sense, that was a little bit of uh, uh, an overview, which kind of brought different subjects together, geometric evolution, applications in material science, pretty abstract analysis on metric spaces, and, uh, uh, and this, uh, uh, this very practical uh, numerical tool of, uh, of thresholding, which, uh, which here come together and, uh, uh, and uh, are connected. Okay, so let, let me stop. Are there any questions? You know? uh, so you mentioned that in the Riemannian structure of the curvature flow, it's genuinely Riemannian in the sense that the metric and the new configuration. Is that still true for the, the discrete scheme? No, so the, in the discrete scheme, uh, the metric is really uh, even Euclidean, but, um, but it's not the limiting metric, right? So it's a little bit, in a certain sense, the uh, passing to the limit in the metric is subtle. Uh, in, in, in when you restrict it onto characteristic functions, it plays this kind of geometric role. But before you do that in the scheme itself, it's completely Euclidean. Let me give you an analogy. I don't know how much you're familiar with uh, either kind of, I mean, with free boundary problems in solidification, like Mal and Sikirka, Stefan problem. Does, does that ring a bell? Uh, I'm not very <laughs> So there, there are free boundary motions uh, where, which can be seen as the gradient flow with respect to the H minus one metric which is Euclidean, right? H minus one, that's a Hilbert, Hilbert space. And, but still uh, in the limit, and you can write down a time discretization, which just sees the H minus one metric, but the limit uh, is kind of, in the limit you have a truly Riemannian, uh, Riemannian structure because, you're because your space on which you restrict this metric is a curved space, namely the space of kind of characteristic functions which doesn't have a linear structure anymore. So I would say here, it's a bit the same phenomenon that in this numerical scheme, this metric, uh, I can show it again, is completely, um, um, here it is. This metric is, 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 you know, I mean, it's Euclidean, it's, this, it's the Euclidean metric. Uh, but uh, in, 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 the, in, in the limit, it turns into something Riemannian because you're restricting, in the end, you're restricting to characteristic functions. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. This is like a similar form with like, a, an in, it's like some sort of infinite similar form, right? This distance. Because if you take the Fourier transform, you get like e to the minus, uh, e to the t squared times the square of the, of the, of the function in there. Yes, yeah, so it's a very negative, it's a very negative for you now, right? Because you're, thanks to the convolution, you get rid of all the small wavelengths. So it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, in, in, but, but then it depends on H, right? The norm itself depends on H in a subtle way, not just because of the prefactor, but also because it's an occurrence. Okay, we had another question. Sorry, I'm going to start in order. John, please. Uh, yeah, in the, uh, so in the, when, when these sigma ijs fail to satisfy the triangle inequality of negative definiteness, at least at the very end, the thresholding scheme that, that you proposed on the basis of this, I mean, that at least seems reasonable, even if the sigma ijs don't satisfy these conditions. So I mean, what uh, is what so, goes wrong that we lose a lot of these? So, you know, so, um, so I mean, the, the scheme, um, where is it? So, so this scheme looks pretty oblivious to whether these things are negative definite or not. But uh, we couldn't show, I mean, if those are not negative definite, we couldn't show, we wouldn't have this uh, uh, assured property that this energy function decreases from step to step. 
because the difference would be given by a quantity of which we can no longer control and decide. So, so therefore, even kind of the very first step of our convergence proof uh, would break down. Now, I don't remember whether Selim did numerical simulations in such a situation, whether in fact also the scheme would start being unreasonable. That I don't remember. That's a good question, but uh, he might have well done that. But, uh... So, as you know, in the two phase case, if you use a level set method, you can develop a superior. Um, I assume that can happen in these various interpretations here. No, that so, so, uh, um, so that's not so much. So, the problem here is that you cannot rule out a ghost interface, right? That uh, uh, two uh, uh, kind of uh, two interfaces in this limiting process would approach. And then in the limit, you don't know whether you should keep it in with multiplicity two or not. But, uh, uh, but fattening in a certain sense is ruled out because um, Because you have this, I mean, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps that's too naive an answer. But, uh, but we, I mean, we we uh, we do control the uh, uh, this BV norm at every step. I mean, fattening is what the price you pay to get uniqueness of the flux. Yes, yes. And so then, there's no uniqueness. There's no there's no uniqueness. But still, I mean, still you would get convergence to something that's non-fattening for for subsequence. Right. So if you start out with if you start out with initial data. Uh, uh, which would give you fattening in the, uh, in, in, in the, of course, the, uh, um, uh, um, this scheme uh, uh, would select, what, I mean, by passing to a to subsequence, you would get one of the two solutions. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I think maybe I, I, a point went by a little fast, and I just wanted to clarify. When you said that the assumption you require for your conditional convergence result um, is the same as it appeared in this previous work by Lukas, do you mean indeed this exact same energy appeared in their previous work and it said this need to be bounded, or just the analogous assumption? The analogous they assumption okay, yeah. because they yeah. don't, uh, yeah. so they don't have this object. What yes. they, what they, uh, what they suppose is that uh, uh, that the parameter of this thing does not drop into this. Someone asked a question. Is it yeah, I don't know. Do you have any question? Anyone else? So I, I do have a question which reflects my lack of knowledge of geometry flow. Uh, uh, um, so I was wondering, is this? So let's say I start a geometry flow and I run it for infinite time on some body, for example. Is that going to collapse to a point, or is it going, or can I scale it so that it actually remains a body, maybe like uh, some sort of ball or something? Okay, so so um, here, if you have two phases um, and you have kind of uh, you're not in a very unstable situation, an, an ungeneric initial condition, it would always collapse to a point. But it's not difficult to modify the scheme in such a way that you preserve the, the volume. Okay. So that's volume preserved mean curvature flow, in which case it would converge to ball. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so that's a modification of the scheme. You can do that both on the level of the numerical scheme and on, on the level of this variation analysis. And Tim Knox has, uh, has the, done the, that. The, the dumbbell that you presented. Yeah. Too degenerate, right? So this one presents some singularities. It's going to it's going to just have some topological singularities along the way, right? That, so so that does not rule out topological singularities, and uh, and so for dumbbell initial data, if uh, 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 so, let's say let's say that it's, it would be slightly asymmetric. Probably you would first uh, now that's without yeah. So with volume constraint, probably what what would happen first is that uh, it would pinch off. Uh, um, and you would have two two balls. Uh, if they don't have exactly the same radius, there would be some kind of ostrite ripening in the sense that the smaller one would shrink and the larger one would converge to uh, to the limit. And, and so, uh, 
the, the, the question I had was, is this a variational perspective on the mean curvature flow suggest some guidelines as to, you know, some developing some other geometric flows, for example, that would avoid singularities in this setup or? Probably not. And in fact, I would say um, the, the singularities are perhaps something which you do want, okay. right? I mean, both, both in imaging applications, I think uh, if, you, if you try to kind of find a contour or so, I think uh, you would like your, uh, your scheme to actually be able to pinch off and to kind of enclose, uh, enclose something which has, uh, which has you know, low contrast. If, and that you would do, but I'm sure you're more familiar with this than I am, by, um, by introducing some kind of heterogeneity in the, uh, uh, in the interfacial energy, that uh, uh, the interfacial energy is low where uh, you have high contrast in the image so that curves would like to migrate there and stay there. But then in exactly in such an application, I think you very much like this, to be able to, uh, the possibility of the scheme to change, uh, change topology and thereby necessarily have a singularity. Can you choose a Sigma is uh, so relatively depending on the data such that you preserve the volumes of the cells. So in order to let this uh, converge, you know, to um, the, the minimal cluster configuration or something. No, but uh, but again, uh, also in the multi-phase case. Uh, so if you don't. Uh, uh, if you, uh, I mean, generically, you will get this coarsening, right? Okay, sure. And that's what people, you know, capturing this is exactly what people are would be interested in in material science. Now, if you want to, uh, if you if you if you want to converge to an hexagonal lattice, you could do the, do the same thing. You can prescribe the volume of each of the phases by by slight kind of modification of the scheme, and then presumably you would expect that you would converge to hexagonal lattice. Let's say the volumes of the phases is equal. So uh, I was thinking more of, uh, you know, not necessarily you know, the tolls, but also RD, you fix the volumes and you want to get faster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that in principle, I think that can be so. So, I mean, imposing, uh, imposing I mean, the, the scheme, both the practical scheme and the variational interpretation can be twisted in such a way that uh, no matter whether in and out or more than just two phases in order to preserve the volume. So in principle, that, that could be, I mean, one could run in the numerical experiments to, for this type of cluster problem. More questions? There's a question on Zoom. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Is there any chance to make the convergence result of the scheme quantitative, namely the order of error in time step H? Uh, um, so, so I think um, um, if now if, I, I think uh, this is what uh, Aaron Yip and Drew Schwartz did that they. Um, in a smooth situation, kind of wrote down a real asymptotic development of this uh, of this uh, MBO scheme. So, so I think, uh, like always, when you want to do a, when you want to have a quantitative convergence result here, which uh, would be a first order for this type of scheme, and second order in space, first order in time, you can do that as long as you are. Uh, close to smooth limiting configurations. Um, in moments of topology transition, you would expect that this convergence breaks down. I mean, just by the fact, as Craig just said, that you have non-uniqueness and kind of, of course, uh, non-uniqueness is, is an obstacle to any type of uh, convergence proof. But, uh, but when, as long as the limiting configuration is smooth, uh, it's conceivable, and I think, uh, in some sense, it has been done. 
Thank you. All right, so uh, let's thank uh, Felix again for a while. We have refreshments. Uh, oh, yeah. That's the best thing. Yeah.